Before we begin with these scary stories, make sure to hit that subscribe button if you are brand new, as we upload some of the best scary stories and true crime content that you're ever going to hear on YouTube. Also, if you are currently subscribed, make sure and double check that YouTube hasn't unsubscribed you, as this seems to still be an ongoing issue. But with that said, sit back, relax, and let's get started with these scary stories. Back in 2011, I was within a circle of friends that made it a tradition to go camping at a certain spot every May long weekend. The spot we chose was in a beautiful area, right on the edge of a large lake, and was located on government land. The lake itself had a dam on it, so during May long, the water levels were always low, if not completely empty, making it possible to walk across it. People were allowed to camp there, so long as they weren't causing trouble or making a mess, and it was generally a good time for everyone. The spots themselves were spaced far enough apart that you had your own privacy, but not far enough that you couldn't meet other people. In this particular year, our spot was in the middle of a small hill, with one campsite below us, and one above us. The first night of our trip happened without incident. During the second day, the people staying at the site below us had moved in. We didn't think much of it and continued drinking throughout the day and into the night. At about around midnight, the people at the campsite below us were really out of control. They were yelling and screaming and their music had gotten even louder. So our friend Ben went down to ask them to turn it down. He was promptly punched in the face and he came back to inform us that he was 90% sure that they were on drugs. After that, the vibe wasn't as relaxed and we were all somewhat on edge. I myself was feeling really tired, so I just decided to go to bed. Some of my friends were still awake, including Ben and one couple, Lily and Derek that were visiting another campsite we had made friends with that day. I could hear that the campsite below us was still blasting their music and partying pretty hard, but I just tried to ignore it and go to sleep. I don't know what time it was when I was jolted awake. Parts of this are somewhat of a blur. All I know is that I sat straight up as soon as I heard the screaming and yelling coming from outside my tent. I quickly ran outside to find our campsite in chaos. One of my friends was clutching their chest. People were running around and screaming to call 911. I was quickly informed of what happened. Apparently, not long after I had gone to bed, the people camping at the site below us decided they weren't finished talking to Ben, and on their way up, they had encountered Lily and Derek walking back. Now, Derek and Ben are about the same height and have the same color hair, so they thought and assumed that Derek was Ben and bottled both him and Lily over the head with a full glass bottle. I don't know if it was the same guys that showed up at our campsite, but I was told that everyone else was sitting around the fire when two or three huge guys appeared from the darkness and walked over to them. One had a paring knife, and the other had a butcher's knife in their hands. Ben saw the knives, and had gotten up to talk to them, and had barely spoken a word, when the guy with the paring knife stabbed him once in the chest. At the same time, some people from the campsite above had seen the guys coming, and came down to help. One of the guys, Tim, was coming down the hill when the guy with the butcher's knife ran up to him, and stabbed him in the stomach. From there, sheer panic ensued. People called 911, but the ambulance was over half an hour away. This is where I came out of the tent. Tim's wound was bleeding profusely, and he was losing blood way too quickly. His friends ended up putting him in the back of his car and speeding off to meet the ambulance halfway. Ben was also bleeding, but his wound wasn't as deep as Tim's and we were able to keep him calm until an ambulance arrived. The guys with the knives ran off into the darkness, back down to their campsite, and took off in their Land Rover. 
My boyfriend and I, at the time, had gotten into his car and drove to the entrance to try and flag down the policeman on their way to the scene. Once they arrived, we were informed to stay in the car as they had released a canine search unit to hunt down the people who had stabbed our friends. By the end of the night, they had arrested the men. They had tried to flee by driving their vehicle across the lake bed where they got stuck in a muddy section of the lake. They were on a concoction of several drugs, as suspected. Luckily, both Tim and Ben survived. Although Tim had lost a lot of blood and took a few weeks to recover from his wounds, Derek and Lily had huge goose eggs and possibly one person had a concussion, but I can't recall. It was definitely the scariest thing I've ever experienced, and a few of us had to testify against them in court. So yesterday, I was at my sister's house with my mom, watching my son and nephews play in the yard. One of my nephews, Harrison, was picking bark off a tree when I remembered an odd encounter I had as a kid. I said, so weird, out loud, thinking about the encounter. My mom inquired what I was talking about, so I told her. When I was a kid, I was hanging out at the Pinecone Forest, which was what the neighborhood kids called the small patch of trees on the side of the road. I was picking bark off of one of the trees to pass some time, waiting for my friend Frankie to finish his homework and come out to play. Out of nowhere it seemed, a guy came up to me. I could smell him before I saw him. He smelled like stale cigarette smoke. I was kind of scared when I looked at him. He wasn't very old, but he had a very lazy eye that was cloudy, and his teeth and fingernails were stained yellow. My mom taught me to be nice to people, even if they don't look like me, so I faked a smile and said hello. What are you doing? He asked me. The smell of his breath was the worst. Um, I'm picking the bark off this tree. You shouldn't do that. It's like picking off the tree's skin. How would you feel if someone picked off your skin? He said, while lightly pinching my arm with his sharp yellow nails. I don't know, I replied and took my arm back. Just then, Frankie's mom called for me out the door and told me to come wait inside. I didn't think anything of the whole thing at the time. When I told my mom about it, she had this look of, I don't know, guilt, maybe? She said that it's probably time I know the whole story. She thought I forgot about the whole encounter, so she never brought it up with me. First, you should know that the neighborhood I grew up in was a small, tight-knit community. Everyone knew everyone and there was no reason for an outsider to come unless they knew someone there. Anyway, here's what happened with this guy. Frankie's mom, Sonia, noticed a white van with no windows parked on the side of the road. How cliche, right? She didn't recognize it, but figured maybe it was a visitor for a neighbor. Sonia said, or rather told the police, that the van had been there all morning and afternoon. She was kind of keeping an eye on it. She said she just had a bad feeling. Her house had a huge window in front facing the pine cone forest and the van was parked next to it. She saw me waiting for Frankie and kept a constant eye on the van while holding the phone just in case. She saw the man exit the back of the van and walk up to me. As soon as she saw him grab my arm and pinch me, that's when she called the cops. That was, of course, when she called me into her house. The cops stopped the guy just outside of my neighborhood. In the back of his van were binoculars, a Polaroid camera, and pictures of me taped all over the walls and ceiling. Me at school, me at my grandparents' house, at the bank with my mom, just me everywhere I went. But that's not all. He had a key to his storage unit on him. Inside the unit, they found a cabinet full of knives. A lot of knives. Paring knives. 
a butcher cleaver, a thin flay knife, a melon baller, and just various knives of all shapes and sizes. There were also a few anatomy books, obstetrical equipment, duct tape, and ten empty five-gallon buckets. In the middle of the unit was an old bed that was used to restrain mental patients, so it had wrist and ankle straps, and the entire inside of the unit was covered in plastic wrap. My mom said he was in a high-security mental institution for the criminally insane last she heard. So, that's pretty creepy to me, and I figured I'd share it with you all. This happened when I was really young, on a military base. All my life, I thought it was just a really weird and terrifying reoccurring dream, until I mentioned it to my parents when I was a teenager, and they admitted it was completely real. They just didn't tell me all this time, because they didn't think it would matter to know it's true. I was playing on a playground, and my older sister was around nearby, but not playing with me. There was an officer's son by me though, and he started somewhat being nice. I remember him looking at me really close in the face and getting a big smile before he says, You have really pretty eyes. Now little me is super happy and says thank you, that's nice of you. Probably just some vague compliment. He was only a few years older than me by the looks of it and neither of us were older than 10 years old. He grabs a blunt stick that was laying next to us, and then pins me to the ground, and starts to try gouging my eyes out within seconds, and it's at this point I'm just stupidly staring at him, confused and worried. I never encountered violence like this in my whole life, and before I know it, the kid is holding my scrawny ass down, and talking about how he's going to physically take my eyes away from me. It's then I start panicking, because can you even take eyes away from people? My sister shoves him off of me and gets me to run with her away from him to our house. There wasn't anything we felt we could do when we told our parents, because again it's the officer's son. When I'm a teenager, and this is all coming to light, they tell me they did talk to the officer. They told him what his son did was terrible and they didn't want it to happen again, but the dad was pretty entitled about it, and we just ended up not going out to play much anymore until that kid moved away. So, little psychopath grown-up, please, let's not meet. You've left many nightmares. During my early 20s, I worked as a meter reader in Iowa City, Iowa, a meter reader is the person who records how much electricity, gas, or water you've used each month. If your meters are on the inside and you want an accurate bill, a meter reader must enter your home, whether you're there to let them in or not. Edit. Just to clarify, we only entered homes if consent was given when the customer first signed up for the service. Customers also provided us with keys if necessary. Entering a home when the owner isn't present is something that I never got used to. No matter how loudly I knocked, I never shook the uneasy feeling that I wasn't welcome. The inside of a home is of course the ultimate private space. A home's exterior is just the image of ourselves that we project to the rest of the world. But the further you venture inside, the closer you come to truly seeing what kind of person lives there, and if you want the raw, unfiltered truth, head for the basement. I myself hate basements. I've seen walls that look like giant, static-filled TV screens, until I realized it was roaches scurrying across a white background, cobwebs so thick and dusty that it looked like the cotton candy machine exploded at the Spider County Fair. I've seen rats, snakes, feces, weapons, neglected children, abused pets, homeless squatters, massive hordes, bizarre sexual items, a makeshift meth lab, 
and even a coffin. There are rational explanations for all of these things. Well, maybe not the coffin, but there was one basement where what I found was beyond the grasp of logic, and that's what made it so terrifying. It was an old apartment house. From the outside, it looked like every other house on the block. I entered the back door and found myself at the top of a staircase. I ran my hand along the wall until it grazed a light switch. I flipped the switch, but no lights turned on. I myself wasn't carrying a flashlight. A typical route involved five or six hours of walking, so I carried as little as possible. Oftentimes, I used the light from my handheld screen, but it only illuminated whatever was about a foot in front of it. So armed with the world's worst lantern, I made my way down into the darkness. Once at the bottom, I blindly shuffled across the room, one baby step at a time. With arms outstretched and head down, I eventually reached the far side of the basement. I shined the dim light from my handheld along the wall and discovered two doors. Each door led into its own small room. I chose the door on the right and found the meters in the far corner. As I entered the reeds, I began hearing noises coming from the other room. Something was definitely moving, and there was whimpering that grew louder the longer I listened. I eventually realized it was a dog. It sounded weak and distressed. I tried to open the door, but it was locked. At this point, the dog was scratching the other side of the door. I felt helpless. I reported it when I got back to the office but I couldn't shake the thought of the dog. It stuck with me over the next month, until it was time to return. So, there I was, one month later, back within that basement. At least this time I knew where the meters were located. I shuffled back to the little room on the right, while keeping my ears open for any sounds coming from the other room. This time I heard nothing. I read the meters, and started making my way back up but I couldn't shake the memory of that dog. Was it still trapped inside the room? My curiosity got the best of me. I stood outside the door for a few moments, listening, but still nothing. That's when I made a huge mistake. I tried to open the door. I had no more than jiggled the doorknob when I first heard it. Screams, blood curdling screams, unlike anything I'd ever heard sounds that I didn't think a human was capable of producing. Short, piercing, high-pitched shrieks, followed abruptly by a low, drawn-out guttural moan that ultimately morphed into something that I can only describe as crying, but much louder. It was all over the place, like some sort of psychotic freeform jazz. I stumbled backwards, nearly losing my balance. I shouted something like, Hello? Who's there? There was no response, just screams. Are you okay? Do you need help? Still no response, just screams. There was no doubt that I yelled loud enough for him to hear me. He didn't want my help. He wanted me gone. I fumbled my way through the darkened room toward the exit. When I reached the top of the stairs, I just stood there, listening. I was trying to wrap my mind around what I was hearing. I waited for the screaming to stop, but it never did. When I finally left, it was still as loud and demented as when it began. I felt relieved, but that quickly vanished when I realized I had to do it all over again next month. I reported what I'd heard, but nothing came of it. As my return drew nearer, a sense of dread grew inside of me. What kind of lunatic sits alone in total darkness? and silence. My mind created endless explanations for what kind of hell lay beyond that door. By the time I returned, I'd built him up in my mind so much that anyone other than the devil himself would have been a letdown. But there was no sign of him the next month, or even the next several months. I'd never given up on solving the mystery, however. That's when a stroke of luck pulled me back in. One night, I went to a concert with my friend Lara. 
After the show, I gave her a ride home. She'd moved somewhat recently, so she had to give me directions. I didn't pay much attention to where she was leading me until she pointed to a house a ways up the street. I couldn't believe it. She had moved into the house with a mysterious room in the basement. This sounds weird, but have you noticed anything odd about the basement at this? I began to ask, but before I could finish my sentence, she blurted out, A crazy guy lives down there. Finally, I had a confirmation. She went on to tell me that even though her apartment was in the attic, she often heard him yelling late at night. But that wasn't all. She had actually met him. One day, while walking to her car, she saw him standing in the lawn. He stood perfectly still, with no expression on his face. He was directly in her path, so she cautiously made her way around him. She noticed he was staring at her, so she offered a friendly hello as she passed. He had no reaction, except for one unsettling exception. He stuck out his tongue, then quickly sucked it back into his mouth and resumed acting like a statue. Thoroughly creeped out, she got in her car and drove away. Two or three months later, I finally met him myself. I entered the back door, like I had so many months before. This time something was different. There was a light on in the basement. I peered down the staircase. At the bottom, a ragged looking dog was staring back at me. It was the same dog I had heard during my first visit. Then I noticed something else. Behind the dog, I could see a pair of bare feet. The ceiling blocked my view of the rest of whoever was standing there, but it didn't matter. I knew it was him. I should have left right then, but I didn't. I know this probably doesn't make any sense, but at this point my desire to finally get some answers outweighed my fear. I shakily called out, meter reader, and started to make my descent. As I made my way down, more of him was revealed. He looked to be middle-aged, his head was shaved, and his eyes were wild. He was wearing pants but no shirt. What I remember most was how lean and sinewy his body looked. It had the look of a body that was never at rest. I explained who I was and what I was doing there. To my surprise, not only did he talk to me, but he actually sounded somewhat normal. The volume and pitch of his voice was odd, but he said the same sorts of things that people typically said to meter readers. I even started to doubt whether or not he was the same man I'd heard screaming, but his behavior slowly removed all that doubt. You see, as I read the meters, he rapidly paced back and forth. He was constantly wringing his hands together and spastically cocking his head from side to side. The longer he talked, the more agitated he became. He began grimacing, and little verbal ticks started popping up in his speech. Every so often, he'd blurt out a loud, aww, in the middle of a sentence. He was trying to suppress these sounds, but he was losing the battle. I started to make my way to the exit. He followed. His verbal outburst grew louder and more frequent. I was petrified. When I reached the stairs, I drew our conversation to an end and said goodbye. As I turned to head up the staircase, he could no longer hold it in. Screams. The very same unforgettable screams that I'd heard coming from the locked room. I ran up the stairs as fast as my legs would carry me, flung the door open, and rushed back into the daylight. A month or two later, I had a couple of friends, including Lara, over to my place. I was excited to tell her about my encounter, but as I was relaying what happened, I could tell that something else was on her mind. When I finished telling my story, she told me about something she'd seen a couple of weeks earlier. One day, she noticed lights flashing outside her window. She looked outside, just in time to see police officers placing the man from the basement in the back seat of a squad car. She later found out from another tenant 
that he had attacked someone with a knife. That was the last we ever saw of him. I don't know what became of the man in the basement. I like to think that he got the help he needed, but maybe that's just because I'd rather not think about the alternative. So today has been a particularly slow day at work, and I've been killing time reading these stories. Maybe enough time has passed, and I can share mine. I had this friend, who was really into the occult. Unfortunately, I was the one who got him turned on to it. We had a mutual appreciation of the paranormal, and all things weird, so I thought the subject would interest him. He started going deep into the subject, to the point where he wouldn't talk about anything else. He would actually interrupt a conversation and force the subject back to the occult matters. Rude, but sometimes people go through phases where their interest is all they want to talk about. It was a mostly forgivable offense. I think I should mention that this particular friend didn't have a very large friend circle. His depression and introverted nature kept him inside a lot. He didn't have the best luck in relationships with women either. His world was kind of small, and I did enjoy hanging out with him, so I did my best to be a good friend. I didn't want to just brush him off because he was acting a little weirder than normal. Honestly, for the longest time, he was a totally normal guy. We chat and play video games together on the PlayStation, Sometimes we'd go see movies, with my boyfriend accompanying us. We'd all hung out at the park. We went swimming. Overall, we had a good time hanging out. Things, however, started to go downhill when he started to smoke DMT. Personally, I think psychedelics are amazing tools that can offer insight into your life, but they should be treated with respect. My friend got to the point where he was making it himself, apparently a pretty easy thing to do after a meager amount of research, and he was smoking it daily, multiple times a day. For those of you who aren't familiar with the substance, when you smoke it, you get transported to a different world, an entirely new plane of existence. Your body and yourself don't exist anymore. You're just exploring this alternate reality dreamscape. My personal experience with it led me to seeing a dragon once in this kaleidoscope of a cornucopia. People see all kinds of different things there. Imagine what that does to a person when they're smoking it 30 plus times a day. He started telling me things like he was the reincarnated Osiris. He said he was seeing Egyptian hieroglyphics all over the place and walking life. Apparently, he had an hour-long conversation with entities in his bedroom, even when he wasn't smoking DMT. Of course, I was very alarmed to hear all of this, and I told him he needed to take a serious break. No drugs at all for a few months, so he can find a solid footing in reality again. At this point, I was still hanging out with him because he obviously needed some help, and like I said before, he didn't have a lot of friends that could actually give him that. He was also the black sheep of the family, so I knew he wasn't getting any kind of support from them. He was really close to his sister, and I did reach out to her on Facebook to express my concerns. I pushed her to talk him into getting some psychiatric help because he was slipping past the point of no return. I'm not really sure if she took my messages seriously, since we didn't really know each other. Plus, she is at least six years younger than us, and possibly didn't grasp how serious the situation was becoming. In any case, I'll jump forward now to the part where things start to get really creepy. My boyfriend made arrangements to hang out with our friend at the park, I didn't really want to go because I felt like I needed a break from him and his nonsensical ranting. I just couldn't deal with it on that particular day. My boyfriend said he wasn't all that bad and we went anyway. We get to the park and he is his usual self, ranting about Egypt and made up gods that only he knew the truth about, etc. 
He also had this large hunting knife that he kept fiddling with the whole time we were on the walk. He told us that he had began using it in ceremonial magic and that it helped to banish negative thoughts. It made me extremely uneasy. He would do this thing where he would take the knife and make stabbing motions near his heart or head like he was mock stabbing himself all while holding a conversation with me or my boyfriend. I think we were both really on edge and didn't know how what to do or what to say about it. I tried to distract him from doing it by bringing up other subjects that might interest him, but he kept on with his ritual. Keep in mind, we were walking on a trail, so it wasn't like we could just say goodbye then and there. We had to walk back to our car and drop him off at his car. My boyfriend had the bright idea that we should get some lunch after our walk, even though I was doing my best to give him a look that said, no way, why do you think I'd want to spend any more time with this nut? But it must not have been very effective, or my boyfriend was ignoring it, not sure. Either way, we ended up getting in the car to go get lunch. In the car, I was driving, my boyfriend was in the passenger seat, and our weirdo friend was in the back. As we're heading through a busy part of town, where all the shopping and restaurants are, I hear the distinctive sound of a belt buckle coming undone. Then, I hear the worst sound imaginable. I peek back out of the corner of my eye, and my suspicions were confirmed. This crazy guy was full on pleasuring himself in our back seat. I mean, pants all the way down, bare ass on the seat, beating it so hard like it was like he wanted to rip it off. Instantly, I felt sick to my stomach and all the nervous energy I had throughout the day popped up into my head. I was trying not to shake and trying to ignore it and drive through heavy traffic. I kind of had a freeze response, I guess. The whole time, I kept thinking about that huge ass knife he had in his pocket, and obviously he was completely off his rocker now. I was afraid to say anything or confront him because I didn't know how he was going to react. This part is nuts, but my boyfriend didn't seem to notice, and the whole time he kept rambling on about God knows what. I couldn't listen because my thoughts were 100% focused on driving and trying to act like I didn't know what was going on in my back seat. We get to the restaurant and my boyfriend runs inside to grab food. I'm left alone in the car with our friend and try to act like I'm browsing on my phone when really I'm watching and listening as hard as I can. We don't talk. My boyfriend gets back and I complain that I'm tired, it's been a long day, let's drop him off, etc. So I drive us back to our friend's car and he doesn't get out of our vehicle, he just sits there. I now have to get a little rude and ask him to please get out and go home. He gets out of our car and walks over to his passenger side. I start getting really scared and I suspected the worst. He pulled a gun out of some kind of bag he had on the seat and he just walks over to our car with it. I don't know why the hell he did this, but I was so pissed I just got out of my car and walked right up to him. I was maybe three feet away and I could see it was a loaded 9mm. I kept asking him over and over again, what are you doing? Because apparently that's all my brain could think to do. I told him to get in his car and go home, but he never said anything during this whole time. Just kind of cried and had this wild look in his eye. For whatever reason, he then got back into his car and drove off. I told my boyfriend obviously we are to never hang out with him again and that I didn't even want him to talk to him anymore. No contact. Nada. A few months pass and he occasionally messages me through the PlayStation or texts my phone. He says a lot of random stuff, and I just ignore it. It turns out that he moved down to Tennessee near Nashville, but I don't know why. He had a roommate, 
and I think their girlfriend lived there. I'm not really sure about the situation. I think maybe he's turning his life around and getting a fresh start down there. I think it's best to cut all contact and let him regroup. I'm not interested in any kind of friendship with him, and I know he needed help beyond what I could offer. Again, I reached out to his sister and let her know that he had a gun. She actually managed to get it from him somehow, but it did little good in the end. I get a call around 11pm one night that wakes me up. It's a man claiming he's a detective down in Gallatin, Tennessee, and my heart skips a beat. I start sweating and immediately ask what happened. Apparently, my former friend stabbed someone to death on Halloween day. I don't know all the details, and the articles about it are kind of sparse. The whole thing is really surreal, and I'm just left feeling like I'm lucky that I didn't get shot last summer. This whole thing turned out way longer than I meant it to be, but that's the story. I'm still feeling creeped out by the whole ordeal, and I'm kind of feeling sick after writing all of this out. A warning on the following story. Its theme is a physical abuse and what happened with OP. If that's something you're uncomfortable with, then please use the timestamps and chapters feature to skip ahead. If you're okay with hearing these details, then here is that story. So I'll just throw this one out there. In the early 2000s, when I was 4 to 5 years old, my parents had just gotten through divorce and my mom started dating this guy. Anyway, my mom started seeing this guy and he would come to our house regularly. Things didn't seem that bad at first, but he actually drank daily. This was something I didn't understand yet at my age. But yeah, let's skip to the bad stuff. So this guy wasn't all that bad with my sister, who was two to three at the time, but he took some sadistic interest in hurting me. He arrived at our house almost every day, and the first thing he would do was take off his belt and start beating me with it. This got to the point where I would hide if I knew he was coming. As for why my mother didn't leave him then, he threatened to kill us if she did. Now, this one incident is burned into my memory. On one random day, he'd found a nice little cardboard box. He picked me up and shoved me into said box and sat on top of it. My mother was doing the dishes and I assumed she couldn't hear me screaming for her as I peered out of the box's handle hole at her back. Before we covered the holes with his hands, I screamed for a good few minutes as this asshole just laughed about torturing me. The only reason he got off of the box was that I had a small screwdriver in my pocket that I used to stab him in the ass. This got him to fly off the box and pissed him off because he wasn't having fun anymore. He picked me up again, carried me off to my room, where he proceeded to beat me with his belt. Then he left me in my room after taking my lamp and locked my door. To be honest, I was afraid of the dark, so I cried and screamed some more. I did so until he finally left, and my mother came and opened my door. The random beatings would go on, until eventually he got in trouble for something and ended up going to jail. Sometimes, I think maybe my mother called the police on him. He called my mom from jail and told her that if she found anybody else, that he was going to kill her, me, and my younger sister. We ended up moving three cities over, and as far as I know, my mom never heard from him ever again. This asshole is almost single-handedly responsible for several of my long-term phobias, and as an adult now, I'd kick his ass if I saw him again. So, psycho asshole, for my sake and yours, let's never meet again. A 
About two years ago, I moved into a new apartment. The walls were very thin, and because of the fire safety laws in my city, my bedroom had one window, which led into the living room, and none with outside access. The window will be important to the story later, I promise. Anyway, it was three bedrooms, one for me, one for the master tenant, and one spare, which at the time was rented out by a pretty friendly guy. Well, friendly guy had issues with his work visa and had to move back to Canada last minute, leaving us about two weeks to find another roommate. Our quickest and easiest option was Craigslist. Due to my work schedule, I had no part in the selection process, but was content when the new roommate moved in a little later. He seemed a bit off, but friendly. He was a very tall, large guy, but pretty quiet, and not someone I wanted to go out of my way to hang out with, but it was okay to be around and be cordial with. About two weeks into his move, the master tenant left for Hawaii, leaving him and I alone in the home for the month-long duration of his stay. For the first few days, things are normal. All of a sudden, about four days into the trip, I am awoken at about 8 a.m. to a frantic knocking at my door. Roommate. We'll call him Kyle. He's standing there when I open up, and he looks frazzled. He looks me dead in the eye and says, So, do you want to tell me what went on last night? To which I was shocked and confused because I'd come home from work at about 9 p.m. and immediately showered and went to bed. I explained this to him and he tells me that he heard me screaming and arguing with someone in my room, that he saw me in the side alley of the window arguing with our landlord whom I'd never even seen at that point. He also said that he heard people coming in and out of our house. I tell him, no way, none of that ever happened. After staring at me for a little longer, he leaves and doesn't bring it up again. The following morning, I wake up to the same thing. This time, he says he saw me arguing with my boyfriend. I was single at the time. He had seen me talking with our roommate, who was in Hawaii, and asking me for the badge number of the officer I'd spoken to, since he had apparently seen me talking to a bunch of police as well. This time, I get angry and more or less tell him to cut this shit out, because I'm not doing anything and don't know what he's talking about. He gets a weird look on his face and says, I think I had a seizure in my sleep. The next time it happens, call an ambulance, and he leaves for a bit, only to start knocking again about an hour later, and when I open up, Kyle repeats the exact same story, verbatim. This happens once more, before I tell him to leave me the hell alone, and leave for work. I go to work as normal, and I'm reluctant to return that night, but I'm too tired to switch to an alternate location. That in itself, was a big mistake. At about 1am, I wake up to slamming doors. Kyle is pacing back and forth between his bedroom, the living room, and out the front door, walking in and out of each room, turning the lights on and off, mumbling angrily, and slamming the doors. I can see his figure pacing back and forth through the frosted window in my room, that leads to the living room. Since my room is dark, he cannot see inside. Suddenly, he screams, I can't live like this. Why are you doing this to me? I think he's on the phone, and I don't respond. A few moments later, he screams my name repeatedly, and I realize he's directing it towards me. Now, I knew I had to get the hell out of there, so I very quietly creep out of the bed and start getting dressed and packing a bag of clothes for work in the morning. I am almost done when he screams, I hear you, and charges over to my room, slapping the wall next to my door, 
but not touching the door itself. I look towards my window and see a shadow lean all the way forward, pressing his ear against the glass. I was terrified and I sat completely still, unmoving. He eventually screams my name again and moves away from the window and I hear him start pacing between rooms again. Now, my shoes are kept on a rack outside my door and not inside my room, so I know that when I leave, I'm going to need a moment to put them on. I decide to wait until his pacing takes him out of the front door again, at which time I plan to grab my shoes, put them on, and run. As I'm formulating this plan, the pacing stops. He screams, Do you want to fight about this? Come out right now and we'll fight, I swear to God. I'm very small, I'm a five foot girl, and this guy is easily three times my size, so I'm definitely not looking to fight, thanks. After a few minutes, he turns off all the lights, and I hear the door to his room open and close, then followed by silence. I wait for a moment to be sure I can't hear any movement and then decide to take my chance. I took a breath and pulled my door open quickly. I step out and grab my shoes before I look up a second later and I see him standing shirtless with just a pair of boxers and sock on in the dark of the hallway. His arms hung slightly outward in an awkward position. He says in a low, calm voice, Ma'am, we need to talk. That was a hard no from me, so I grab my shoes and run out the door with them in hand. I run about a half block barefoot before I stop to put them on. When I look back, he is standing in the porch light of our front door, watching me run, but not moving. Luckily, I had a friend who lived two blocks away, and I had their spare key, so I let myself in and crashed there for the evening, and that's where I stayed for the following week or so while we worked things out with the master tenant, and Kyle agreed to move out within the week. He says he doesn't remember anything that happened or wasn't sure if it was real or not, but if I said that's what went down, then it must be real. The day Kyle left, he sends me a photo of the house key sitting on the table and says, I'm out, nothing else. I take a friend over there with me to scout it out and ensure that he has actually left. When we get there, we discover that not only had he left a ton of food and furniture, but he had ripped all the fire alarms out of the ceilings. He had unscrewed and removed the deadbolt to the front door and left them lined up neatly on the front table. We then realized that my front door can only lock by using a key from the outside and it had been locked when we arrived, meaning that Kyle still had a key. Needless to say, we called the locksmith immediately. Even after changing the locks, I was still terrified to stay there alone afterwards and I never went to sleep at night without barricading the doors with chairs, as well as other furniture. To this very day, I still fear for his safety. It was obviously psychologically unstable, but also wonder what could have happened if I hadn't been as lucky as I was. I used to live in a townhouse duplex, by myself with my dog and two cats near a train station. There were often commuters who park outside my place and pass by through the day and night. Occasionally, I had cigarettes or stuff stolen from my front veranda. I even had my next door neighbor's ex-boyfriend come to my door as he told me he had a hitman after him and he had a gun. But none of this scared me like the night I was watched. My dog lives indoors, and I would take him out for a last wee before bed. My backyard light was broken and was up too high to change the bulb, so I always took him out the front. That night, 
It was around 11 p.m. and I took him out the front. It was a hot summer night and I was mindlessly standing on the footpath when I saw movement across the road from me. Out of nowhere, a man had appeared and was walking diagonally across the street away from me. I thought it was odd because I hadn't seen him come from the other direction. I continued to think about it. Where he came from was from outside a house that was being renovated. I knew the owners weren't living there and thought maybe he was going to try and steal stuff. So I kept looking down the road to where he had gone, yet turned the corner down the next street. I kept watching and then I suddenly see his head pop around the corner to see if I'm still outside. This gives me the absolute creeps, so I grab my dog and go inside. I then turn off all my lights and go upstairs to my bedroom, which is at the front of the townhouse, and faces the street. I thought I would keep watch of my neighbor's house and call the police if he came back. I peer through my blinds which cover sliding doors coming off of a small balcony, and, like clockwork, I see a dark figure walk down from the corner and down my street. He's moving towards the house across the road, and then I suddenly lose sight of him. A tree in front of my townhouse obscures my view for a moment, and then he is there. He's not just there, he has stopped at the top of my driveway, standing there like Jason Voorhees. I kid you not, his arms were out by his sides and legs apart in an unnatural stance, like he was preparing for something, like he wanted to kill me. My heart is racing so hard that I can barely hear anything and I'm standing there slack jawed and looking at this would be assailant when one of my cats comes to see what's happening. My cat slides his body between the blinds and window, further opening it and I can see this person, this man, looking up towards me. I'm thinking surely he can see me. If he does, this doesn't stop him. He now starts walking down my driveway, undeterred and fixated. I lose sight of him under the balcony and awning. By this time my eyes are watering in fear and tears are streaming down my face. I don't know what to do, so I go sit on my bed. I pick up my mobile and dial my father, who lives a suburb away. He answers. I whisper to him what was happening and he said he will be there as soon as he can. I then lie down in my bed and lie as still as I can. Tears are rolling down my cheeks, pure fear, not knowing what this man was doing downstairs and if he could get in. I mean, what if I hadn't locked the doors? And then it dawned on me, why am I lying here in the dark crying? Turn a light on. So I did. What seemed like a lifetime but was probably just a couple of minutes later. My dad arrived. He had an umbrella with him. I live in Australia, so no guns, but he could have at least brought a knife. I stayed on the phone with dad while he searched outside for the man. The man was gone. Maybe me turning on the light scared him off. So I called the police who said I should have called sooner. Of course I should have. I just didn't know why I didn't. They came out with a sniffer dog and didn't find him either. I don't know what he wanted, but for a good year after that, I was so scared of living there. I'm still a scaredy cat, but reading other stories makes me realize I'm not alone and we can all learn from these experiences. So we, I, know what to do if something scary happens. I. 30 year old female, live in a relatively safe neighborhood, barring of course the occasional mugging attempts, one of which took place right against my bedroom window with one of my neighbors, or even the few times a random guy in his car follows me to my place asking for my phone number. Things are generally stable. I typically have a way of dealing with these assholes by taking advantage of a random empty lot on my street where cars can't drive, which forces them to go around the block, and by the time they manage to turn around the corner, I will have ran back into my house. No biggie. Anyway, a few months ago, 
Some genius in our street paid someone in the city to move the neighborhood garage disposer to another place. Whereas before, it was right down the block. Now it's a few minutes away. Now, with that said, I have to walk a while before I can throw my garbage away in a usually quite busy area, which I find actually embarrassing. So I started waiting until nightfall to do so. I know, I know, stupid, especially with everything I just told you before. But I got sloppy. Things started feeling safer in the last few months, and so I felt comfortable leaving my home after sundown. Until last Sunday, at least. Like usual, I waited until it was dark to go out. After throwing the garbage, I stopped by the convenience store nearby to pick up some things I needed to get. On my way back to my place, and at the entrance of my street, I noticed a young man standing in the front of a parking lot located in front of one of my neighbor's house, across the street from mine. He was talking on the phone, and looking away from me too, but as I rounded up the corner, I noticed a guy sitting quietly on his motorbike right in front of my doorstep. Something about the way he was already looking at me, just as my eyes landed on him, freaked me out. I did a quick math and realized that by the time I would be able to open the door, if ever, he would catch me if he wanted to. This time, the empty lot trick wouldn't work as I would have to walk past him first, but also his motorbike could be driven on it. I turned on my heels back to the convenience store, hoping he was just a delivery guy waiting for someone to meet. I daily dallied at the store for a while, but when I went back home, I found he was still there on his bike, while the guy in front of my neighbor's parking lot was also still on his phone, just staring at me before I'd even seen him at all. I realized then and there that something was not right, and luckily I had noticed that the security guard of the street behind us was actually sitting in his booth. I approached him and then explained the situation, hoping he'd walk back to my place with me, which he gladly did. The moment the guy on the phone saw me return with a security guard, he put his phone in his pocket and turned towards the guy on the bike, who then drove to him. Keep in mind, these two were not even looking at one another, let alone looked like they knew each other at all. But the guy who was on his phone sat behind the motorbike dude, and they both drove past me while staring at me. Both the security guard and I agreed that something was funny about the entire situation, and he thankfully waited until I was safely behind locked doors. I don't know if those two wanted to mug me, or if they had more sinister intentions, but I'm just glad I trusted my gut instinct and didn't just go home. Otherwise, who knows what would have happened to me. During university, I had a slew of creepy encounters, and this has stuck with me the most. One day, a group of us were walking together along campus, and slowly members began branching off. It ended up as just myself, and a guy who I was not inclined to befriend at all. I only knew his name, but I didn't want to be rude and not keep walking along with him. He asks me where I'm going, and I tell him I normally take a nap between classes and was going into my dorms. He asks if he can see my suite. Now, normally this would be a no-brainer red flag, but my particular building was renowned for being fancy and others frequently asked to see inside. I say sure, not wanting to be mean, and thinking this guy will take a quick look around and give the typical jealous comments, and then leave. So we go inside and I show him the basics, doing so in a way that we ended up back at the entrance of the suite. This whole time, he's not saying much, and I'm only announcing things dryly, so I was confident when I said a quick, it's pretty nice, see around, that he was going to take his leave. I turned around and went to my room. I did not show him any rooms or say where anyone stayed. A few moments later, as I'm setting my stuff down, I turn around and he is there in the doorway. He's silent. I do not say anything because I do not want to invite him in. I want him to go. I just look at him and then start picking my stuff up, 
and moving it around, trying to look busy, he slowly walks a couple of steps into the room and asks, have you done the coursework yet? And I tell him, no. By this time, I assume he's trying to hang out and tell him again that I'm planning on napping. He doesn't even skip a beat and says, that's okay, I can watch you sleep and help you with it after. A smile, no tone, then silence again. I immediately tell him he needs to leave and follow him until he's actually out the locking doors and I know he can't follow me back in. I told a lot of our friends about this and they were heavily creeped out and made a point not to leave us alone ever again. We finished the year out and I haven't thought about this guy in a long time. I did not know anything about him at all. Still, I only knew his name. Flash forward a year and some change to the next summer when I'm taking a bus ride home from a different part of campus, so it is not my normal route. We get to one of the points where the bus stops and waits until a certain time before it can leave again and everyone else that had been on the bus gets off at this stop. At this point, the driver starts talking to me and asking a lot of questions. I did not think anything weird at first and answered what I thought were idle chat questions. So, which apartments are you in? And what classes are you taking? Then, as more and more questions just kept coming, I started to feel uneasy with his mannerisms and I became extremely vague in my answers. I still don't know if he was always intended to tell me this, but he then stopped peppering me with questions and began spilling a story of how his son was in my math class the previous year and he knew all about me and started giving me a lot of family details. It's at this point that I realize his son is the guy who wanted to watch me sleep. All the details start to fit, but I had to know for sure, so I ask if his son is called, insert his name here. He smiles and says, yes. He then mentioned how he would like to start riding bikes with me, and would I ride bikes with him and his son? I was gathering my stuff by this point, and I decided to get off the bus. There are two doors, one at the front, and one halfway which was closest to me. The doors stay open while the bus is at these stops so people can naturally hop on and off and the driver normally gets off and takes a break. As I'm getting my stuff and getting up, the halfway door shut. I look again at the driver, an older man but much larger than my petite frame and build. He is now standing facing me but the front door is still open. He asks again, will you ride bikes with us? I want off the bus and think the only way is to pacify him. I say yes and make my way to the front door, not knowing how to get around him. He looks pleased but asks where I'm going. I try and tell him I've decided to walk home but he still blocks my way and tries to talk me out of it. I'm firm in that I want to walk from here but he will not move. I'm standing in front of him, wishing to move, but my body is frozen in place. Slowly, he decides and says, Give me your phone number and I'll let you go. Now, I really, really don't want to do this, but I also want off this bus immediately. My first thought is to give him a fake number, but I'm so glad I didn't as he immediately dials said number. It was a test. Seeing my phone ring and watching me save his contact, he moves enough that I slide by and make it off the bus. After making it home, I go to block his number and already have multiple missed calls and a voicemail of him just breathing. The situation was reported and I did not see him on a route for a long time, but around a year later, I was getting on another bus and I noticed he was back. I've never covered my face and backed off a of public transit faster than that before. Let's never meet again, father or son. TLDR. A guy followed me into my dorm 
and told me he wanted to watch me sleep. A year later, while I'm alone on a bus, the driver questions me, then reveals he is the guy's dad who knows all about me and shuts the bus doors as I try to leave. He blocks my exit until I promise to ride bikes with him and give him my phone number.